Back in my day, we went to school. Hey friends, Dr. Abdul Al Sayed here. Before I go on, make sure to like, subscribe, hit the little bell so you never miss our content and tell your friends. We're trying to have an important conversation and given that most of them are not at school, I guess you have more time to talk to them. Look, I'm being a little bit tongue in cheek here. I don't blame the kids for the situation that they're in. But the truth of the matter is, is that too few of them are going to school. I, I want you to take a look at this graph here. What this graph shows you is absenteeism by school. The proportion of schools where there is, quote, extreme absenteeism, more than 30% of students absent at any given time, is 43%. I want you to think about this. Nearly half of American schools are places where 30% of the pupils are missing. Now, that's a pretty crazy thing because I can tell you I grew up in the 80s and 90s and when I was a kid, you just went to school. It really didn't matter what the situation was. You just went. And that's been the culture up until, well, COVID. Because if you look at this graph again, take a look at the comparison between 2017-2018 school year and the 2021-2022 school year. In 2017-2018, only about 14% of schools had more than 30% absentee. So you're talking about a tripling of the number of schools where 30% of kids are chronically absent. That is an absurd statistic. Now, I shouldn't have to say this, but school's kind of an important thing. It's important because, well, it's the place where we impart basic skills on you, like math and reading. And yeah, in that department, it follows that when kids don't go to school, the consequences, well, are clear on what kids can actually do. We should take a look at this other graph here. These graphs come from our friends at the 74. They do some excellent reporting on education. I hope that you'll check out some of their resources. Here you've got the percentage of students scoring at or above the reading benchmark. Now, I want you by comparison to take a look at the 2019-2020 school year that's in the lightest green on the left, where right around 58 or 59% of kids in kindergarten up to the third grade were at what you'd expect them to be. Now that's still pretty low, given that that means that more than 40% of our kids are not meeting the benchmarks for reading at baseline. But take a look at what's happened over time. As you move forward to the right, you've got the impact of the COVID-19 school shutdowns. 2020 to 2021, 2021 to 2022, 2022 to 2023. And the sad thing is, while at least at the kindergarten level, you've seen an increase at the third grade level, these are kids who were in kindergarten during COVID, they've kind of stabled out at about 5% lower than they were pre-pandemic. So kids aren't going to school and it's showing in terms of their abilities to do the things that they need to be able to do. The other thing you have to understand about school is it's a place where a number of lower income kids get their basic needs met, whether it's low and reduced price lunch so they get their square meals or it's access to adults who are paying attention to them. And sadly, too often, you've got situations where outside of the school environment, there is a certain level of negligence or the lack of capacity to provide for that kid. So as kids are missing school, the question becomes, where are they? And what are the consequences for them, particularly in situations where they may not have homes that provide them all the basic needs that they deserve? I wanna talk a little bit more about why this is happening and what we should do about it after this message from our sponsors, the Marguerite Casey Foundation. Marguerite Casey Foundation is proud to partner with Nationswell to present Doppelganger, a trip into the mirror world. The Marguerite Casey Foundation book club event designed to make sense of the vertigo-inducing post-pandemic shadow world that feels all too familiar. Join the MCF Book Club for an in-person event in New York City on Wednesday, April 24th for a conversation with author Naomi Klein, author, scholar, activist, and 2020 Marguerite Casey Freedom Scholar Kianga Yamada-Taylor, as well as filmmaker, writer, and activist Astra Taylor and Dr. Carmen Rojas, president and CEO of Marguerite Casey Foundation, as they make sense of this parallel social universe and chart a path towards shared purpose and power. RSVP today to save your seat for this free event at caseygrants.com slash book club. That's C-A-S-E-Y-G-R-A-N-T-S dot com slash book club. And if you won't be able to join the club in New York City, do consider sharing with your networks. So I want to talk a little bit more about why it is that kids just aren't going to school at the same rates. Remember, 43% of America's schools are in chronic absenteeism, meaning more than 30% of pupils are absent on a given day. Number one, I think COVID just broke something about what we understand school to be. As I said, when I was young, we just went to school. But during COVID, when schools shut down, their role as a pillar in society, a place where students just went, that started to dissolve. And kids could imagine a world where they didn't actually have to go to school. So could parents. But when you break something so fundamental as the idea that kids have to go to school, the ramifications are pretty huge. And I think that's part of what's explaining the situation here. But there's another issue at play. And that's that there's, I hate to say it, been a return to child labor in this country. Take a look at this headline from the New York Times, if you don't believe me. Yeah. So unfortunately, too often kids, particularly kids in lower income families, they're going to work. And again, a lot of that goes back to the pandemic. Families that were teetering on the edge, who all of a sudden lost work because of the pandemic, 
relied on the labor that their kids could provide. And so that created a different norm. Rather than the kid going to school, the kid was now going to work. And once you start instituting that norm, it continues. Now, this isn't the child labor of yore, where you have kids in meatpacking plants potentially getting their arms chopped off. But it is more kids spending more time doing different odd jobs than it is kids at school learning. Now, remember, we fought this fight about child labor over 100 years ago. And so much of what we built up when it came to public schooling and child labor laws were two sides of the same coin. They were about creating a safe, protective, nurturing environment for kids while also making sure that they weren't risking life and limb. But we've taken a step back and a lot of that also goes back to the pandemic economy. When you had a situation where families were teetering on the edge as it was and lost work opportunities because of the pandemic, they may have found opportunities for the kids to work. Whether that was at a minimum wage job serving fast food or something else, once that norm took hold, it's hard to change back. And unfortunately, these two things seem to be going hand in glove. But the last point here is about the role of anxiety in shaping the experience of going to school. I want you to take a look at this other graph here. It demonstrates the number of kids who say that they belong at their school environment. We've seen a massive increase in anxiety, particularly social anxiety with the advent of smartphones and the internet. It's a regular hobby horse I talk about all the time here. And part of that has implications for whether or not kids feel safe and comfortable going to a social environment at their school. Once that norm breaks and you have to reintroduce yourself back to a school environment, that becomes a real problem. So these three issues, the breaking of the norm in the first place, the fact that we've got more child labor happening, and then the social anxiety that's taken hold among kids, all of these have created a toxic brew wherein absenteeism has become a new norm. So what do we do about it? Well, number one, kids shouldn't have to work. And one of the things we can make sure we do to make sure that kids don't have to work, that their family don't rely on them as breadwinners, is to make sure that their families aren't experiencing poverty in the first place. And you know what did that during the pandemic, in fact? The child tax credit. But unfortunately, we let that sunset rather than renewing it and making sure that families that had extra mouths to feed had the means to be able to feed them. But another thing that we can do is invest in schools in the first place. Too often when we think about what a school is, it's a bunch of teachers and a bunch of rooms with a bunch of kids. But a lot of the paraprofessionals, the folks who facilitate the social experience at school, th those folks, they're understaffed and they can't do all the work that they need to be able to do. So it's not just about getting a kid in the classroom, it's about making sure that that kid is comfortable. And part of doing that is investing in the social workers and the paraprofessionals who can facilitate that interaction, who can go and have a conversation with a family or a kid, understand what their worries are and help to facilitate their re-entry into the classroom. So part of fixing this problem is just fixing this problem. It's filling up classrooms so that that norm, that school is an optional thing, starts to fall by the wayside. All right, friends. So I'll see you soon because I got to take my kids to school.